Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Today's theme is the healings, the healings. Uh, Jesus has been healing since he's been coming down from the Mount of Sermon. Uh, If you remember, Jesus left the people with great words of power and authority, and now he seems to be proving it to them, that he has the authority and power even over the sickness that mankind suffers. Let me ask you a question. You may know this. You may not know this. Maybe you haven't thought about it, but it makes sense. But did you know that Adam and Eve did not have a mother? And so if they didn't have a mother, neither one of them had mother-in-laws, right? So they were probably the happiest couple. On the, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding there. <laughs> Mother-in-laws get the bad rap, you know. It's just Why is that? I don't know why that is, but they do. And so this morning we're going to look at Christ heals Peter's mother-in-law here in verse 14 through 15, and then 16 and 17, a few more healings. We're not going to spend a lot of time uh, with those two verses, but we're going to spend some time here in 14 and 15. It says in verse 14, Now, when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his mother's or his wife's mother laying sick with the fever. So he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and served them. Here we have the context of Jesus coming now to Peter's home. We find this story also in Mark and in Luke. Matthew does not report the fact that Jesus just came from teaching in a synagogue. He was probably sharing the gospel message with the Jewish people there. He was probably sharing the truth that he shared on the mountain of, uh, of, the, mount of uh, the, uh, the mountain of sermons that he taught there with the people. And now he's coming to Peter's home. Matthew's account is the shortest account of the other two. He only uses 30 words, where Mark uses 44 words and Luke uses 38. I don't know why the word count matters, but Matthew is quick to the point uh, that Jesus entered into Peter's house, saw that Peter's wife's mother was sick, and he went and touched her and healed her from her uh, fever. The healing of Peter's wife's mother is the third healing that takes place after the Sermon on the Mount. The first one, if you remember, was a leper uh, who had leprosy and came to Jesus and worshipped at his feet and Jesus touched him because he was willing. The second was a Gentile servant, uh, uh, a Gentile centurion servant who was an outcast of society, and Jesus was willing to speak the word, and it was done without him being in the presence of that servant. And now we come to the third one, the mother-in-law. A woman, basically, who at that time and that culture did not lift women up very high. Today we do more than ever. In fact, we go kind of to an extreme with it. Uh, We do lift women up. We put them in positions. We give them places and opportunities more than ever before. We are living in a society that has recognized the power and the authority that that women do have, the wisdom and the smarts, uh, you know, simply said. uh, We see that today, where in the times of Jesus, they didn't see that. A woman in that particular culture was not even respected or esteemed at all. They were just kind of bypassed and thrown to the side. In those days, if a woman was pregnant and she was in labor, everyone would come together to the house. They would grab uh, all the materials that were needed for a great big celebration as she was getting ready to give uh, birth. The midwife would come out and say, it's a boy. And everybody would just start to celebrate. They'd throw a big party, uh, uh, relatives and friends, and it would just be a really exciting time because a boy has been born. But if the midwife came out and said, it's a girl, everybody would pack up and go home. That's the culture of that time. So we see that women in this society were not highly esteemed. In the Beatitudes, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And women are meek to a certain degree. There's a lot of power there, but power that's under control. They have wisdom, and sometimes we as husbands or fathers uh, need to listen to our wives or to our mothers or to our sisters because there's some wisdom there, and we need to consider it. Mother-in-laws are meek. There's a story that um, I can tell you about my mother-in-law 
And, and it's something that's always with me because she has always protected my marriage with her daughter, Virginia. She's always been on my side in a sense. Uh, she's always encouraged us and, and so forth. I, I wasn't always the best husband. And there were times where I had failed quite often. And Virginia would get very upset with me. And she would kind of uh, separate herself from me. And at the time, we would uh, see her mother and her father and go to their home. And she could tell that something was wrong. And she'd always go to Virginia and say, Virginia, that's your husband. What is going on? And she'd say, well, this and that. And she said, that's your husband. You stick by him no matter what. And that's how she always would respond to her. And so she'd kind of like, oh. And she would always do that. That's your husband. You stick by her. And so I really love my mother-in-law for doing that. And I respect her for doing that and not trying to separate my marriage, not to try to destroy it, but to keep it in unity. And that she understands, even though she's not a believer, she understands that a wife is to stick by their husband. And that is a, a principle that is lost today. It's so easy to say, no, we don't need to stick by anyone. Uh, who I'm an individual, I have rights and so forth, but that's not the biblical principles that we see in the Bible. If you, have a, if you are a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law and you don't, you don't want to mess with your mother-in-law, they will inherit the earth, the Bible says. Now let's look at the text a little more closely here. Look at verse 14. Jesus had come into Peter's house and he saw his wife's mother laying or thrown there. And of course, thrown in the sense because she didn't purposely go lay down. But this fever that we, she was sick with threw her into bed and she had no choice. And she'll see laying there in a fire in a sense. The message uh, kind of gives us a picture here of Jesus found Peter's mother-in-law uh, sick in bed, burning up with this fever. Mark says, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew and with James and John. So apparently Peter's house was either um, the home of Andrew also, which is Peter's brother. Maybe they owned it together, it doesn't say. Or maybe Andrew lived there with them, uh, according to Mark. Matthew just says Peter's home because Peter lived there. Uh, we're not told why Jesus went to Peter's home. We can only guess why he went to Peter's home. He probably knew that Peter's mother-in-law was sick and probably wanted to heal her. Or it could be that he saw that opportunity again to show and to give evidence to not just to the world, but to Peter and the apostles that he does have the authority over sickness also. But we really don't know. But we do know that it's for a good reason. Otherwise, he wouldn't have put it in the Bible. Now, from the text, we see that Peter was financially set. I mean, to ha own a house, you're doing pretty good, especially at that time. Uh, I was there on Capernaum where Peter lived, and it was a pretty sizable home. It could house at least a good two or three people in that house. They had the, the remnants of the foundation and so forth. They built this little gazebo over it to preserve it, and people can come in and see how Peter might have lived. It was close to a synagogue and so forth. So it, it was a, a reasonable home. He wasn't wealthy, as maybe some teachers might have you think so that you can give more to uh, their ministry, but he was taken care of. It was his house, and he had a wife there. Peter's house was probably furnished with normal furnishings like anyone else's house at that time. You know, it's interesting that sometimes I, I get comments from people, just as a minister, and I just heard this on the radio too, um, about a scripture that uh, Paul talks about, how if you have sown spiritual things from your minister, that it's a great thing to reap, that they reap material things from you. And the person was asking, you know, what does that mean? And so the Teachers were saying basically the saying if the minister is ministering to you, a pastor is ministering to you, and you're growing in the Lord and you're understanding who Jesus is, then you should support him. You should take care of him. And it's funny from time to time where I get comments from people is like you shouldn't be receiving anything from the church. You shouldn't receive any compensation whatsoever. And there were probably a good 14 years where I didn't receive any compensation. Uh, for doing this job. But now the Lord has blessed enough where I can now do this full time um, and study and study and study. I usually come here in the mornings on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. 
and I'm here for a good four to five hours just doing work around here, uh, helping the administration um, with all the work there, all the legalities, all the, the bills that we have to pay and insurances and you know anything to deal with the building and uh, guys that come out and help me to take care of the building, maintain it. I'm usually with them. And then from there I go home. And then I study from there till I go to bed. And usually I do that from Monday to Friday. Thursdays lately, and and I'll be honest with you, I've been taking Thursdays off. You know, I have this injury that I've had for five years. And I've been in bed, and I'm still in bed to a certain degree. But all of a sudden the Lord's healing me, and it actually feels good that I can go out (laughs) and actually do something. Now, I go to the beach for one reason is because I lay there most of the time. I'm not actually doing anything. I got tickets from last year that one of my sons gave me for an annual pass. We still haven't used them because I can't walk that much. So they're just sitting there not used. But I can go to the beach and lay there, get in the water, feel normal, ride a couple of waves and feel normal. You know, that feels good. But other than that, I'm here. We were here yesterday working on the the unit. At least the guys were. I was in here uh, studying, helping Virginia do some things. But it's interesting how people think that ministers should be humble and should be poor. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Paul was very clear that, that if they pour into you spiritual things and you grow and you have a better understanding of Christ, that they are to re- re- reap uh, your material things. And I want to thank the church <clears throat> for their support, that we're at a point where we can do that. And it would be nice to get to a point where we can even add more staff and supply their needs so that uh, we can continue to grow. So Peter was taken care of. The Lord provided for him. Now, we know by Mark's account in chapter 1, 21 through 29, that Peter's house was in Capernaum. John tells us that Peter's city was Bethsaida. So it may have been that he was born there, but we find Peter now residing in Capernaum. We found last week that Jesus city was Capernaum. That was his headquarters. That's where he worked out of. And so we see Peter now living where Jesus' headquarters is. And it could be that Jesus wanted Peter closer to him, or Peter wanted to be closer to Jesus. And that's always a good thing, uh, to always follow Jesus, isn't it? Wherever Jesus is, we should be. Wherever he's leading, we should follow. That's a good thing for us to do as Christians. So Jesus sees Peter's wife's mother laying sick with a fever there. Uh, One point here that I want to make really clear first is Peter is married. He does have a wife. Uh, There's a thought out there that Peter wasn't married because he's the first pope of the Catholic Church. Well, that's not true. He was married, and it's very clear by this statement. In fact, when I started looking up Catholicism doctrine, they all agree that Peter was married. They have no problem with that whatsoever. Unfortunately, they still think that he was the first pope. Paul makes a reference to marriage uh, among the apostles. In 1 Corinthians 9, 5, do we have no right to take along a believing wife as do also other apostles, the brothers of the Lord? So apparently the brothers of the Lord were married. Some of the other apostles were married. And then he says, and Cephas, who is Peter. So Paul recognizes that Peter was also married along with some of the other apostles. And uh, there's some debate whether Paul is saying, can't we take our wives with us? Or he may be saying, we have a right to bring our family. Uh, Some believe that Paul wasn't married. Others believe that he was married. I kind of lean that he was because in order to be a part of the religious Sanhedrin group of the Pharisees, one of the requirements was to be married. And so I think Paul may have been asking, we can bring our wives too. But why is it that you don't hear anything about them after that? You know, you don't really hear a lot about them. They're not lifted up. They're not spoken about. It's really the men the God, that God had called to the ministry to fulfill the Great Commission, those apostles. But be that as it may, they were married. Nothing wrong with being married in the ministry. I think it's a good thing. I think that we can run into trouble. Um, and we've seen that with the Catholic Church, haven't we, in the recent years, some of the troubles that have, have taken place because men uh, are not married and they're trying to live a single life, it is a hard thing to do. And by the way, if you can't live a single life, then you need to start praying about getting married and finding someone that the Lord would bring to you and and wait for the Lord to bring that person to you. He saw his wife laying there, and it was with a fever. And it's interesting that this fever was great. Luke tells us a great fever. 
Peter's mother-in-law was loved, especially good to Peter. Uh, she's obviously living with Peter in their home. And so Peter then is probably anxious and concerned for her. Could it be that Peter asked Jesus to come? We don't know. It doesn't say. But Jesus is there, and Peter, I'm sure, is happy to see her mother-in-law healed of this fever. It seems like mother-in-laws get a bad rap, doesn't it? We're always telling jokes about mother-in-laws, aren't we? Don't you always hear jokes about mother-in-laws? You know, there's comedy shows about mother-in-laws. And so forth. there's a sitcom called uh, Raymond. Everybody loves Raymond. You ever see that sitcom? And he has a mother-in-law that seems to be the focus of the whole show. And she's just a quirky mother-in-law who's in everything. And everybody just doesn't like her at all. And so we have this whole thing about mother-in-laws that aren't good. I, I even have a counseling book that, that I... Uh, do premarital counseling with and there's actually a chapter in there and it's called mother it's called in-laws or outlaws and so there's always a bad rap when it comes to mother-in-laws now here's a question that i pose to you are you an exceptional in-law are you an exceptional in-law if you are and i know i'm talking to a a, a wide range of, of age groups here and some of you may not even be there yet so i apologize for that but we're in this context so but if you're an in-law, be an exceptional one. I know that I personally tried to stay out of my son's business, you know. I, I don't try to butt into anyone's business. I, I leave that to them. They're just separate themselves and cling to their wives. And I'm speaking from my point of view and my son's. Um, I don't try to get involved with the, their issues unless they come to me. Uh, same is true with the church. It, it, I don't try to get involved with issues with you, but if you come to me, then I have to give you uh, what the Bible says. But other than that, I stay out of the way. Virginia's more kind of hands-on. She gets involved, and I think it's because uh, they ask her to get involved because they need her help and so forth. But are you a good mother-in-law? Are you a good father-in-law? There's a story. It says a mother-in-law drove her daughter's husband's car to the shopping mall. She noticed how dirty it was on the outside, so she cleaned it up a bit. And when she entered the house, she, uh, she said, The woman who loves you the most uh, in the world just cleaned uh, your highlights and your windshields on your car. And the daughter's husband says, Oh, my mom's here. Not knowing that it was the mother-in-law. <clears throat> I like this little story, too. Agnes and Beverly were discussing growing up children. Uh, do you mean to tell me you haven't seen your son and daughter-in-law? Since they were married, six months now, she says, I'm shocked. She says, what's there to be shocked about, Beverly? Well, I'm waiting for their first baby. Everybody knows that they love grandmas more than they love mother-in-laws, right? Everybody loves grandma, but mother-in-law. I just say these things just joking. I'm not serious about it, but it just seems like they get a, a bad rap. Here, Jesus sees the mother-in-law of Peter, and she's sick. She's sick. And that word fever there shows the seriousness of being sick. In fact, the Greek says fire, pura. She was on fire. It doesn't say that it was deadly or that she was going to die, but it was high in fever, as Luke said earlier. And it's a scary thing to see someone with a fever. If you've ever had a child have a fever, one of the first things you want to do is you know, put them in a cool bath to try to bring the fever down because it may get so high. But fevers are good, too. There's a purpose for fevers. They are to burn out, in a sense, the infection that's in the body. It's, it rarely goes over 106, rarely, but it does happen sometimes. A high fevers are, are common to head traumas, uh, heart stroke, poisoning, side effects of um, an amnesia if you're in the hospital for whatever reason. But they're good things, but they're scary things, aren't they? I can remember the boys getting fevers from time to time. I remember getting a fever when I was little. My mom, old school, rubbing alcohol all over me to try to cool you down and so forth, you know, not knowing better. And so Peter's a little concerned. So is Jesus. And look what Jesus does. He takes this opportunity in verse 15. So he touches her hand. He touches her hand. And sometimes Jesus touches he touches people, and he heals them. He touches the leper, and he heals the leper. Uh, he takes the opportunity to reach out and heal people because of his love and his grace. Two types of people 
that were not looked at very highly here. A leopard and now a woman who are touched by Jesus. And sometimes it just needs a touch. It just needs a touch uh, to comfort someone, to encourage someone. Uh, a touch of compassion, a touch of tenderness and kindness and even love. And Jesus was used to touching. And Jesus touches us. Doesn't he touch us in times of need when we're struggling, when we're hurting, when we're in pain, and we just say, Lord, I just need you right now. I just need to know you're here. And he touches us. Kind of like the little girl who was scared at night, and she would cover herself and kind of cry at night, and the parents would hear her and come in, and, and she'd say, Mommy, and d- Mommy, just lay with me for a little bit. And the mommy would encourage her, Jesus is with you. He's always with you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. And the little girl says, I know, Mommy. I know Jesus is with me, but sometimes I just need to feel some skin. You know, I just need to feel you right here along with me too. And that's okay. We need to be touched and feel from time to time. Some people are over touchy though, aren't they? They get in your face and they're like, hi, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm okay, you know, just step back a little bit, you know. And they're always, do you ever get someone who talks to you and they're touching your arm? You know, and you're like, okay, this is kind of odd, you know, don't touch me so much. Uh, we've gotten away from that touchy feeling thing. It used to be in the early church where they'd give each other a holy kiss on the cheek, you know, from time to time. But we've gone callous from that. We need to get back to it to a certain degree. So he touched her hand. And Jesus honored Peter's mother-in-law by touching her. You know, we're to honor our parents. We really are. We don't see that too often anymore. Let me share some things about parents and widows here. Because we're dealing with a parent and we're dealing with a widow. She's staying with Peter. There's no husband. But she's also the parent of Peter's wife. And she's valuable to that family. The Bible talks a lot about the negative things that happened to widows. And it reveals to us God's heart towards the widows. When we look at the Old Testament, it talks about evil evil doers murder widows and orphans. Uh, There are places where widows and orphans are being murdered. I I saw a video of a woman in a Muslim country who was literally shot in the head because she wasn't wearing her veil. She was someone's mother. And God's going to hold that evil doer accountable We see that in Psalms 94. Uh, There's a scripture in Job 22. It says, you have sent widows away empty-handed. And there are people that do that. Uh, Their widows are barely making it, and they're not helping them. They're not supporting them. They're not there for them. And in a sense, they're sending them away empty-handed, as Job said. You devour widows' houses, Matthew 23. Jesus spoke about the widow's houses. Some take widow's ox in pledges, Job 24, where they put widows under even more burdens because uh, they can barely make it now and they need a hand down, so they hand it out to them, but they require an ox or two, which brings on a greater burden on their life. Um, Zechariah 7.10 says, Do not oppress the widow the orphan or the stranger or the poor. So we see God's heart there, that that's not his heart, that we're to oppress them, nor the stranger or the orphan. It says, I will be a witness against those who oppress the widow and the orphan, Malachi 3, 5. God says, I will be a witness against them. Don't worry, judgment's coming if you oppress a widow. Acts chapter 6, the Hellenist widows were being neglected in the early church and the Disciples needed to do, to do something about that. We are to honor widows. We're to honor parents. We've gotten away from that. And I know and I understand our society. You know, it seems like as the older you get, the more freedom you want, more independence you want. And you also don't want people to know that you have needs and that you need them. Uh, You you want them to understand that you're still independent and you still have some control. That's a hard issue to deal with, and I'm dealing with that myself right now. The word widow is mentioned 56 times in the Bible. That's quite a bit. So it deals with that subject of widows and parents. In Genesis, it talks about Judah. said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house. And so his father's house was her comfort. That was where she was provided for. That's where she was taken care of. And so family is important when it comes 
to widows. Proverbs mentions at one time, the Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the boundaries of the widow. And there are a lot of proud people, uh, the religious leaders, and we, we remember a story where they will say, Coban, you know, our, our material things are dedicated to the Lord, so we can't help our parents, you know, because they're separated unto God, and so our parents may need some help, but we're not going to help them because God comes first, in a sense, and they were saying, Coban, Coban, and they're not talking about their tithes and offerings, they were talking about everything they owned was Coban, it was all for God, but not for their parents themselves. Mark talks about uh, widows twice, and he talks about the poor widow with the two mites, and oftentimes there are widows who are very generous, like this widow who was used as an example of just giving everything that, that she has. And it's so hard to get from anyone else to give to the Lord. Amazing. And she had a heart for the Lord, and Jesus honored her because of that. Turn to First Timothy. Timothy probably talks the most about it through the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> I think this is an important subject. And and it may be more for me than for you, but it will be for you one day when you deal with these issues. Chapter 5, look at verse 3. My Bible has the title for chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, How to Treat All People. How to Treat All People. You mean we have to treat people a certain way? Yes, yes. Well, we're Christians, we call ourselves Christ-like, and so we, there's a certain way that we treat people. Look at verse 3, honor widows who are really widows. And so if they're really widows and they don't have a husband, then you're to honor them, you're to respect them, you're to encourage them, strengthen them, you're to help them. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. So there's a family. Genesis, Tamar. So if the widow has children, then they are to show piety to their widow, to their parents, and support them, take care of them, watch over them. It's good, it says, and it's acceptable to God. Now she, who is really a widow, and left alone, trusts in God, and continues in supplication and prayer night and day, but she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. What Paul is saying there is, if she doesn't have any family, then she's in prayer and supplication, and that's good. She's seeking the Lord, she's praying the Lord, she's serving the Lord. Now, if she's not, then she's just dead. She's an unbeliever. She's wasting her time in a sense. She's dead while she lives, spiritually. These things command that they may be blameless. So this is the command now that Paul is giving to us as the church. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. How many times has that scripture been used to, to suggest your immediate family, like your wife and your children? And yet the context is what? Widows. It's widows, isn't it? It's not talking about your immediate family. Uh, I got this scripture thrown in my face. This guy had um, been here as an assistant pastor, and the church was, wasn't doing very well. And so <clears throat> I made the suggestion that my wife may have to go to work, you know. And he said, oh, you're worse than an unbeliever because she's providing for you and you're not providing for her. And I'm thinking, where did he get that from? Read the context. This is talking about widows, guys, ladies. It's talking about taking care of them. Good verse 9, do not let a widow over 60 years old be taken into the number and not unless she has been the wife of one man. In other words, the church then begins to take care of her if she's got no one else to take care of her. While rooted for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has had lodged uh, strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has uh, relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. And so you see if she's been a servant, and she's done some of these things, washing servants' feet, um, you know, providing for people, just being a good Christian woman. But refuses, but he says, but refuse a younger widow, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they 
they desire to marry. So younger widows should actually go find someone to get married to. So they're not a burden to the church. And they're not seeking the Lord. And all of a sudden they had this desire to get married. And it puts a burden upon the church. And so if you're young enough, then, you know, pray and ask the Lord to bring you a husband or a wife. And besides, they learn to be idle, wanting, wandering about from house to house. And not only, uh, but also gossip and busy bodies saying things that they, <laughs> I guess these were really happening in the church. Uh, women were just wandering around, talking and gossiping to one another. Uh, therefore, I desire that the younger uh, widow, Mary, bear children, manage the house, and give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproach, for some have already turned aside after Satan. If any believing man or woman has a widow, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. How are we supposed to treat widows? Paul is telling us exactly how we are supposed to treat widows here. Some don't honor their parents. You know why they don't honor their parents? For the same reason the religious leaders didn't honor their parents. The love of money. I can't afford it. I have a family. I have kids. I have bills to pay. It's the love of money. Their own needs. Selfishness. Exodus 20 says, Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord is giving you. There's a promise there to honoring them. And the word honor means respect them. Esteem them highly. Ephesians, uh, Paul caught it from the Old Testament, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Now, Paul heard this very loud and clear from Jesus. Very loud and clear. You remember when Jesus was talking to the rich young ruler? He told him, go and sell everything that you have and follow me. And then he talked about giving everything away. And the guy said, give everything away. And Jesus said, look, you keep the commandments. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Now, those are the extreme commandments. Think about it. Do not commit adultery. Someone who commits adultery, that's, that's horrific to the other individual. Do not murder. That, that's pretty bad. That's a bad sin to murder someone, take their life, or even to steal from them. These people will go to jail or even bear false witness, being a liar. You know, that one you can get away with for a while, but eventually people don't trust you. But he lumps that up with the next statement, honor your father and mother. That is so interesting to me. He lumps those all up together. The lack of honoring, respecting, esteeming your parents is just as bad as murdering, stealing, adultery. Mark 7, 10 says, For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death, Mark says, put to death. The psalmist 68, 5 through, through 6 says, Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God is our protector. God is our provider. And we totally understand that. Now, I'm saying this because it's been on my heart because some things have changed in my own family. Virginia and I are what you would call the sandwich generation. <clears throat> that generation is a generation of people typically in their 30s or 40s who are responsible not only for their children but also for their parents. Now, we started young, so we're in our 50s. <laughs> and that's why we're in our 50s and not 30s or 40s. But we're responsible to a certain degree for our children, but now we're learning for our parents. We're getting more involved, especially with our parents. Uh, we're praying, and we offered uh, Virginia's parents, uh, her only parent alive, her mom, to come and stay with us because um, she's got nowhere to stay right now. And so we're going to offer her a room in our house to take care of her. My mom, who is a widow, lives with my sister right now. But I have a certain amount of responsibility. I took her to the hospital on Wednesday, in Huntington Beach, and then back here, and all of that. There's a lot that goes with that. And the sandwich generation basically means you're still involved with your kids, like we are. Uh, we watch our grandkids constantly, on a constant basis, and we're helping out with our children all the time because we love them, 
and we're committed to them, and we want to take away as much stress from their lives as possible. That's really our whole reason for doing it. And we love our grandkids to death. We enjoy having them over our house. You know, it's funny because sometimes, oh, we don't want to ask you again because you're always doing it. You know, we ask. If we can't do it, we'll say, no, we can't do it. But we love them to come over. We love having them around. We love picking on Ethan, the girls and I, all day long. So, you know, we j- it's just a joy to us. It's a joy to us. But now we have this added thing with my mother and her mother. And it's a challenge. It really is. Becoming a parent to an aging parent has extraordinary challenges. I was reading an article about the sandwich generation. It's a role on the stage of life in which no one can ever rehearse. It just happens. The challenges uh, to elders are just daunting to lose control of one's life. And my mom has lost control of her life to a certain degree. Uh, she can't no longer just cook. She can't lo- just go and come and you know, do those type of things. Neither can Virginia's mom. And it's shocking to them to not be able to do those things anymore. And so they're, they're keeping hold of things like Virginia's mom has been going to a bank where she lived forever, and she's like, I can't give up that bank. <laughs> and it's all the way in Roland Heights, 30 minutes away. It's like, come on, a bank. But there's people there she talks to, she knows, she feels comfortable, and now we're, they're asking her to have a bank here where she knows no one. That's a big deal to her. To us, it's like we switch banks all the time. What's the big deal? But to them, it's a change of life, things that shock them, that are frustrating uh, to a certain degree. Um, And it means a change for Virginia and I and for those that are dealing with this also because now you're responsible. Uh, You have to watch over them closely. Thank God for this little phone. I have an app. I watch my mom spending all the time. She's at, you know, she's 78 years old, and so I've got to watch. And once in a while, I'll joke with her and go, hey, I just saw you spend $200. She goes, well, how do you know that? I'm like, because I'm watching everything you do, Mom. She goes, oh, okay, okay. She called me up the other day, and she said, I just want to let you know I spent 100 here, and I spent 100 there just so if you look, and you, you know I already, you know, I'm like, all right, Mom. It's the thousands that I'm worried about, not the hundreds, you know. And I don't control that at all because I think she still has, you know, the mind to spend as she wishes, and that's her money to do so. And I don't want to take that away from her either, you know. But it's sad that when children take advantage of that, I can remember one of the siblings saying, Mom, why don't you just give me everything? And she's like, well, because I have other siblings, and they're entitled to some. Well, what about my daughter? Well, what about their children? It's like, you know, so you have these conflicts going on within the family. Doctor appointments, being financially involved, uh, calling them on a regular basis because they get lonely. They want someone to talk to. Uh, They need someone to talk to. I mean, there's just a, a whole variety of things that happen. But I tell you, it is a blessing to serve. It is a blessing to serve, though it's difficult to do so. And it's an area that I think we need to understand completely. You may be there, and you may know what I'm talking about. You may not be there, but you'll be there one day. Believe me, you'll be there one day. And if you're not there, at least understand those who are in those positions and places uh, as people deal with these issues. Now notice, the fever left her, and she arose. And what did she do immediately? She served him. And in the Greek, the word served oftentimes is used to waiting on tables. And so she probably cooked him uh, and Jesus and all of them something because they were so generous in healing her completely. In verse 16 through 17, we see that evening had come. They brought to him many who were demon-possessed, so the word began to spread. And people thought, well, this guy can heal. Let's bring our healing. Let's bring our demons. Let's, let's bring everything to this guy, and he'll heal us. And he cast out the spirits with a word. Why? Jesus has power just with a word, and he healed all who were sick. That is, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Now, he's quoting from Isaiah 53. And it's important to read that scripture because he's talking about two things. He's talking about our spiritual infirmities and our physical infirmities. And Peter, I mean, I'm sorry, Matthew makes it very clear that Jesus healed both. 
that he took our spiritual sins and he took our infirmities also. And so Jesus has come to save, but he's also come to heal. Does he heal all the time? No, not all the time. There's a purpose for us to be sick. There was a purpose for Peter's mom to be sick, for Jesus to heal her. There was a purpose for a blind man to be blind, that Jesus would come along and heal him. Not because of his sin, not because he's done anything wrong. I thought it was interesting how Roman on Wednesday was talking about Job's friends. Uh, talk about jumping to conclusions, talking about not having all the information. These guys were just giving all their suppositions. It's your fault, jo uh, Job. You must have did this. You were not as righteous. You didn't do that. And they drew all the conclusions they could think of. And the whole time, God was just saying, it's none of that. None of that. I was testing Job to show Satan that he would not deny me. You know, we don't know. Stop jumping to conclusions. Just let God be God and you serve him and him alone.